Hi, my name is Philip Beither. I'm the curator for performing arts here at the Walker Arts Center. And with me is Faye Driscoll, who uh, is a dancer, choreographer, performance maker, and now visual art creator, installation artist. Uh, we just came off the opening of Come On In, a guided choreography for the living and the dead um, here at the Walker. And I wondered if you could talk about what it was like to make an installation without your own body or any of your performers being in the room? Yeah, it's been um, quite a journey um, finding my way um, conceptually and in practice to what this piece is now. Um, I wanted it to kind of spring forth from the research that's actively happening in my choreographic practices. And initially I thought that might be kind of remnant and detritus and the, the set repurposed or the, the stuff um, shown in new ways or video of the project stretched and reworked. Um, but it became really, from a couple site visits I did here, it became really evident to me that I wanted it to remain bodily, to, to remain in, um, that vibratory space of the, of the body. And then I realized I didn't want it to be an actual person coming in and performing though, or doing excerpts or. Um, not one of your company Not one members. of my company members or somebody local or me or, but that I wanted to, my director's voice, the voice that was scoring and choreographing and leading these projects to be the voice that was coming to the person, the audience, the gallery goer, that was coming into their ear and inviting their bodies to be the performer, the receiver of that, um, of that knowledge or of those, those modes of working, so. Was it difficult at all when, you th when we all still in this era, I think, think about exhibitions as primarily visual objects to mm -hmm. view, whether it be a video or a sculpture or a painting and things, to, to let go of that and to be thinking more experientially and more participatory in, in what the experience would be for attendees. Yeah, I mean, I think there was a little, what felt like lack of imagination. Like, <laughs> you know, it felt like we have these binaries inside these different art forms, right? And we think that is, you know, those are objects, those are things to be circled around or... Um, and our spaces are kind of built are, to, in, to sort of house those things right. in different ways. Right, this is a white space, a supposedly blank space for the objects to live in. This is a black box for the lights to come on and for us to be transported. Right. By. And honestly, when I was thinking of it that way, when I was thinking of trying to squeeze my work into that sort of a f object frame, mm -hmm. um, I, it's not that I wasn't interested, I just was a lot, I was a little bit bored by it. Like I, I didn't feel this kind of like uh, activation and excitement. And as soon as I sort of locked in to this direction, uh, I felt the, the edge and the risk and the challenge, mm -hmm. which I tend to crave. Right. Yeah. And you mentioned about um, your role as director and guide for your company, for yourself, and thank you for coming space. Um, you didn't. You also continued to to hold that role for participants who were mm -hmm. listening to your voice on these headphones. Mm -hmm. This is the installation behind us, which is mm -hmm. a a set of six pedestals, one that holds two, in mm -hmm. which people are invited to come and lay down. And here you guide them mm -hmm. through um, an experience. Yeah. And um, yeah. in many ways, you're still like your themes of direct, of engaging audience and guiding them through each of the parts of the trilogy yeah. kind of continued, but without your body being That's there. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it's, it deals with some with that tension of, of visibility also, I think. In, per, in performance, I'm often playing with the tension of performance itself, whether that's 
bringing out the energetics between the performer and the audience or the performer's sort of state of availability and self-consciousness and self-awareness of that availability and power struggle and so in some ways all of that is coming into the body of the gallery goer and that they're invited to do very simple movement but one that kind of turns them into an art object hopefully not from the inside too much <laughs> but from the outside this becomes a kind of tableau vivant a sculpture for, um, those, for those looking at it who from, might be yeah. passing by or sitting waiting their turn and i know you um, found a very i think a really beautiful balance but we're concerned that people not feel too on display or too intimidated mm -hmm. by having to dance in front of others if they really yeah. didn't feel comfortable doing that so you kept the gesture language quite simple mm -hmm. and beautiful um, mm -hmm. and set the pedestals off a ways from yeah. the viewers. Um, can yeah. you talk about how you came to all that? Yeah, there's, um, I mean, from when you walk into the room, there's a sort of theater to the experience and that you remove your shoes, theater or a ritual. The lighting where you remove your sho shoes is quite bright, but the lighting between is quite dim. The, the way on the way to the pedestals is like a sort of abyss that you pass through and the texture changes. You're barefoot, so you feel the carpet, the sound, you become immersed in sound, which is ambient sound that is repurposed from thank you for coming space. Mm -hmm. So you enter a kind of your own zone that is, you know, set back, um, that has a somewhat of a kind of cocooning but yet still there's lighting on each pedestal. So I think there's a, there's a little bit of a hope that you enter and that you are given the permission to sort of exit the you that was there with your shoes, the you that was evaluating everything visually, that was um, standing before the art objects mm -hmm. throughout the rest of the galleries and then kind of sink in um, but it does invite a certain questioning because, you know, you are aware that you're here and that you could be seen. And so I think in a way it really is like performing and that you hope you immerse yourself fully and you sort of can be really present and lose yourself in your intent and lose yourself in the action of performing. But you're never free fully of the awareness <laughs> that, I mean, I just thought of that now, like the, there's... The space itself does hold that, which I think there's a way of being with oneself and beside oneself that I think ah. is something that's interesting to me. And that sense of never, always still having some awareness of yourself, do you mean that both for you, when you're directing performers in your company performing as well as, say, for the whole trilogy, there's a often the audience is uh, Quite, visible and are kind of part of. Brightly lit and in yeah. the round and being um, engaged with or, um, yeah, yeah, commanded or gently held right, <laughs> in some right. way. So and that so, the, those audience members are always feeling that they're both watching and aware of their own selves in that space in relationship to your performance. Yeah, yeah, and getting lost in the watching and then coming back to that awareness, watching oneself watch, watching someone else watch, um, watching the situation that we're in. So I think there's sort of spheres of perception, of awareness um, that I think are really exciting to activate or to be, you know, that we're always functioning within in, in every moment. I heard a sound, where was that from? Yes, Upstairs, right, <laughs> like, right. but that is um, not always something we're practicing actively. And I think that this come on in really, if you give yourself to it, it really invites that. It invites a kind of questioning or heightening of the relationality of ourselves. Um, Did you, um, I don't know um, how much or little you had to be considering, oh, what have other people done in gallery spaces? Or yeah. what, what's been done, what hasn't been done? But um, mm -hmm. to my mind, in my mm -hmm. experience in attending 
contemporary art galleries and museums. I'm not sure I've seen another show that has both, of course there's places that, pieces that have virtual reality or headphone experience or sonic things, but where there's a combined single experience combined with something of a group choreography going mm -hmm, on. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. it works on these levels of both an individual journey people are going on and the chance to witness seven yeah. other, five other, three other people move, moving or experiencing things. Is, yeah. did, was, I, was that a conscious thinking like, oh, I, this is something that's brand new or did it just kind of happen that way? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that there's a certain amount of my naivete that's working for me in uh, this context. Right. And then just in that it's genuinely my interest and it's the thing that I most want to see happen when I go into art spaces or I'm curious about the body in art spaces and how often how unconsidered that seems to me. Um, and it's my own practice and it's, the way that I figured out to manifest my practice inside these constraints and this format. And I also did engage in dialogue with visual artists and friends and... As you develop your ideas. And Pavel right, and sure. just... Pavel Pish, who's our... Pavel Pish, who's a fellow curator, yeah. Who, who really was, took the yeah. lead uh, with a, a support from Molly Hansi. To, to really yeah. curate this, this installation. And yeah, yeah, and so I was excited and a further kind of um, instigated or like encouraged by the awareness that this wasn't happening, that this wasn't something that was par for the core, right. you know, yeah. um, and surprised also, yeah. you know, in a way. Like no one's done but, this before? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. How about last Thursday when we opened the exhibition and you and I were sitting right there, I think, watching people. Yeah. What was the experience to no longer really have any control over am, how know, the experience is shaped? I'm still going through almost feelings about that. Right. It's kind of like, I mean, this is strange, but it's almost like, you know, you wrote a lover a, a letter <laughs> right. and then you sit there watching them read it but you can't tell what they're thinking <laughs> <laughs> and then you sit and you see another one read it and another one read it and you I don't know it's almost like I shouldn't be in the room right or something it's like you you should just be experiencing this on your own and yet I want to the choreography for me the director in me who is at my every single one of my shows is giving notes every night is altering something with tweaking and lighting and mm. the way someone said something and based on the charge I'm feeling and the things I'm reading, it, it's, it's a major letting go. And it's really interesting for me because it's, what, what have I been assuming all this time that I think I know? I mean, right. okay, I'm, I know a lot <laughs> about my work and what I want to have happen, what am I thinking that I know? Of? Often I don't really know what's happening in the room inside anyone's mind, inside my shows either. And so it's been really interesting in questioning that audience relationship for me moving forward. Um, That's great to What hear. kind of constraints do I start with or what frame do I think we're all in? And, you know. Would, was, would you say that was one of the most challenging parts yeah, I say process. it continues to be challenging. Like, I want to be a fly on a wall, but there's no determined result, right? Like, I came here the other day. There was a beautiful older couple who took the, the double pedestal, and they laid back, and they were holding hands. And then they did this moment where they turned in, and then they sat up, and the next part is to lift your arms and put your head in your face. And they laid back down together. <laughs> and they just <laughs> talked and snuggled. And I was like, oh, okay. I mean, all of it is going to go how it's going to go, and none of that is going to be, no matter what I tweaked or changed, you know, like it's, the way to view it would be to try and let go or somehow, or let go of what I think is supposed to happen or what they might experience 
through when this. you watch them lay back down as vocally you know you're instructing them yeah. to put their hands in their face did you feel like oh maybe they're just extending their agency at this moment yeah. or maybe they thought I should just listen to this and not actually perform it or maybe they just yeah. wanted to lay together for a little exactly. bit longer. Exactly, <laughs> all those things and that's what's interesting about it is I thought, oh, maybe that maybe they have pain and it felt better to lay back yeah. and they listened to that and this helped encourage that or yeah, maybe this is their date or right. yeah. Uh -huh. We were talking the other day about one of the biggest debates at the Walker and I think many museum like gallery-based spaces is about how much, if any, sitting areas do yeah. you give the public? Yeah. And in many ways, you've given us a wonderful extreme that not only are people able to sit, they're actually lay encouraged down. to lay down and yeah. to have a different kind of bodily experience. Mm -hmm. um, that yeah. too was kind of unintentional in the sense of counter-museum oh, practice. This is very intentional, this one, and it has, I think, I mean, some of my research for this was to just spend more time. I, I spend a fair amount of time inside art spaces and galleries, mm -hmm. but just to spend more time sort of tracking kind of what I craved. And... Mm. Craved what you maybe didn't get in other galleries. Yeah, exactly. What I didn't get. Um, and, you know, I'm pretty sensitized to maybe to a minutia to everything that's happening mm. <laughs> like a lot of dancers are yeah, and tactically and tactically and exactly yeah. and kinetically and somatically and so and I often am someone who wants to actually stand for an, for an hour in front of a piece or you know stay right. beyond a quick flick uh, so so yeah, I, I'm surprised how little thought has gone into things like lighting, things like places to lay or sit, or um, what actually puts the body in a position to receive mm. um, or to think differently, to change perception. Mm. This very upright stance where the head is up here, right? It's right. one we're really protected in. And, right. um, so. Could you talk yeah. a little bit about, um, in many ways, you, you've long incorporated text into your work, but mm -hmm. here the text and your voice kind of became central, um, yeah. and your, your work as a writer. Mm -hmm. um, I wondered, and I think when we were working or in conversation as you developed the piece, this was one of the, fine, the, the, the last things to kind of fall in. Yeah. How, how did you find the process of knowing that the bulk of the experience would be through your voice and words and the writing mm. process itself. What did you go through in making it? Yeah, well actually, so the text sort of originated in a way through a very personal practice. Um, one for me in which I move through my body and kind of do this sort of talking <laughs> through my body and listening. Um, it's a very almost prayerful and meditative practice that I've started doing. That was one that I just had developed intuitively. Mm. And at some point I realized I wanted to create something that would invite others into that practice. And so that was really like early, that, yeah, I actually had, it's not something I talk that much about because maybe it was so personal and it, it kind of was this way of, of speaking in and out at the but same did time. did you actually speak as you? I would say, yeah, I would say things aloud and I would say things to my eyes and out to the world and how I see and the way I see things and the lens and my optics and what, you know, like my perception. And then I would like speak to my brain and, <laughs> and the, the part of me that thinks it's so in charge of everything. And then like, so it's just kind of these layers of literal physical matter and then kind of what they symbolize, how they might be functioning in the world, mm -hmm. like my brain, the part that's in charge, right? That kind of, so. But so it, was a sp it was kind of a spontaneous. A spontaneous, yeah. So a sp quite different spontaneous, than, like an improvisational, spontaneous yeah. sort of, um, yeah, and one in which I, having gone through a, a lot of loss and death in my life, one that was directly related to asking myself what it means to be alive. Like, 
what does it mean to have this body and this life that I have? And how am I in it while I'm here? <laughs> I mean, it sounds so basic, but these are things that we might be just getting sort of socialized and then rushing along through our lives and trying to kind of be okay in the lives we've had. And, and it, so it's, this practice came up as a way to really, for me, as a kind of coping mechanism with going, wow, I'm gonna die. Right, and I Even feel that really palpable. Like we don't that, think but. we don't like to think that, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. but it just could. It was unavoidable being so close to ones I loved dying and in that process with them, and so it was a way of saying, being in the preciousness of my own body and my own being is what I want, and in the complexity of that, right? But that's not just, you know, if I really feel feel into this ecosystem, it's kind of like indescribably wild and um, complex. <laughs> like, it doesn't fit within even the frame of like, here's my arm, right? And I have the word arm, and we have a drawing of an arm and the symbol of an arm, right? But there's just this, when I feel into it, there's this indescribability, I don't, know how to, I don't know how else to say it, there's something, and so this practice was about kind of being in that, in that feeling, the actual body, and in the describable sort of spaces in the body that connect out to the world, that connect out to our histories, that connect to our psychology, to our family, to our, our longings, to our sexualities, to our, yeah. Right. Did you then think, oh, I'm doing this private practice mm -hmm. for myself. Uh, what if I took this and gave it to someone else yeah. who, um, and then was yeah. there a process of then shaping those words Exactly, carefully? yeah, a process of shaping them. And in some ways for the, for the gallery, I, I shaved them back, like I kind of edited them down to these five to eight minute guided body scan, choreography, poems, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because there were versions that were quite radical and wild that I'm very excited about, but I thought, oh, I want them to enter and not only hear it as text, so it needs to have time in it where you have that moment to really actually sink in to something in your senses. Um, and then to have enough where it kind of like takes a strange turn mm -hmm. or says something that, wait, is that her speaking or is that me speaking, you know? So um, each one has some of what I may do in one of my performance projects actually, which is to kind of try and set up a tone of which, look, I'm here and you're here, like the beginning of space where it says, Hi. Yeah, the open, <laughs> and the opening, opening yeah, yeah, where I'm just sort of acknowledging where everybody came from and their commute and just going kind of almost through all the layers of their sensory experience. And then the piece says, okay, come on, let's go to this really intense place, you know? And so um, each, each choreographed um, body scan kind of does that hmm. too. Right. And each one also pulls from directly from text, from space or play, or from scoring that I used on space play or attendance, mm -hmm. um, or things like I say, like, um, I'm calling your name, I'm singing your name with a chorus, so that's a reference to singing everyone's name in attendance, so throughout, each one also has references back right. to um, the ways those works were created or actual content from those works. Which feels like they're little gems and moments of memory about the trilogy. And I love that about yeah. the work, having helped host the three parts of the trilogy, thank you for coming, and to have it in the same institution but a different frame yeah. for people to be able to remember if they saw any of those parts. And even if they didn't, it feels like the language really works beautifully in and oh, of yeah, it's themselves. So. Um, do, do you feel like you had to spend then many hours on s s 
sort of editing back the language, shaping it on the sonic tone of your voice, on the I did, all that. yeah, yeah, and I think, you know, I did, and I also spent a lot of time, so I started this practice from my body very personally, and then I started to kind of compose it as one that could be shared. And then I started doing a lot of writing, you know, in front of a computer screen, or and at a certain point I realized, okay, I actually need to go back to this coming from the body, and so I had a bunch of text developed, but then I had to kind of like allow it to emerge again through a physical practice, and so it was these layers, and then once that happened, I had to go back and shape it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then I was also looking at, thinking about what position or um, what shape I wanted people to end up in in each one, so each one kind of lands culminates in a physical shape yeah and so then i went back through the research that i have been doing throughout the trilogy but primarily in space where each one each shape in come on in relates back to a painting or a sculpture or um a movement i might do in one of the in space and so there's Which also is, that layer um, of reference is for those who haven't seen it or won't see it, you ha you really did a lot of research for Thank You for Coming Space, the third part of the trilogy around images from art history. And in fact, yeah. you even create a tableau uh, yeah. collage as people come in of those a lot of images. And then your body kind of filled physically some of those gestural yeah. images and stuff. Do you want to talk yeah, about that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I, I'm really curious and I actually asked a couple of art, art historians, like, is there kind of... <laughs> Is there a text that would be I could read about the history of gesture and the history of this representation of gesture throughout time? And, and they were like, well, this, 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 there's no one thing. And so I was trying to do this sort of impossible research um, going towards like, you know, learning about one period of time and sort of trying to dig into that and then doing like a very, uh, personal and somewhat light survey relative to what's out there, but really bringing them all into the room and covering the walls of my studio with them and then thinking about them thinking meaning images the images. From historic yeah, artworks. Yeah, from historic artworks and from contemporary artworks. And really looking at the figure and how we represent the figure. And I'm really interested in the ways that we make ourselves in image we represent ourselves in image, um, and we're obsessed with making images of ourselves. Um, self-portraits. Self-portraits, selfies. Right. Yeah. Um, and how that inaccuracy, right, this, this thing coming into the form of an image, then recreates how we feel ourselves how we see ourselves, what we think we are, based on the images that are created of us, how then informs what we become and what we feel ourselves to be or what we feel permission to feel ourselves to be. And so I engage in a pretty active research process with my own body around embodying, trying to embody, reanimate, um, re wetten <laughs> these inert bodies that are also not just the the body they're the eye who saw them right they're the so um and in, and then it came back to me for at for to absence and how do we recreate that which is gone um and having experienced that how to like that feeling the impossibility of actually having a representation of, um, of someone that's gone, like of having a real complete representation, no matter how much video or sound of a voice or right. image or... Um, so I, in space, I became interested in um, how, we rep how I could represent things through other senses, through sound, through touch, through weight and how did it feel when you re-embodied those gestures from sometimes quite violent and mm -hmm. quite dark yeah. images from art history and contemporary art and things? 
You know, it felt to me like I was attempting to be in a different type of labor with, how do I describe this? It's like we're constantly consuming images now insanely rapidly. Right. And I, I could see a picture of you more often than I could ever, might ever touch you, right? right? Or see your face, you face to face and hear your voice. And so taking the time to, for a long time, like look at an image, study every detail and attempt to put my body into it and attempt to like imagine what this felt sensation of it is and see its, it, see its like painterly inaccuracies and, you know, um, hold its positions and try to feel in to what that experience could really be, it, it's exhausting. <laughs> and it, it also, um, yeah, it created a kind of, I guess, I don't know, range in, in my own system, um, range of possibility in my own system as a performer. Makes me think of Merce Cunningham working with life forms where a computer mm. would create these the bodily systems which were next to impossible, if not mm -hmm. impossible, to actually do with a human body. Right. But then just the act of trying to force yourself into exactly. this weird other thing. That's really, yeah, that's actually a good example because it's, it's much more about the labor that's impossible, like that I will never make myself into the muscly bodies in Rodin's Massacre of the Innocents that are you know, right. heavy but practically weightless and huge and womanly and, you know, right. like yeah. <laughs> holding baby dead babies over their heads. And, right. um, but the, the effort and the labor and my failure create something really interesting to me. Uh, yeah. It's interesting that, you know, really several themes of what you just talked about. You're training as a dancer, even though your work is kind of still comes from a, a place of choreography and dance training, but you've really, it's moved into other realms. Yeah. You've kept mm -hmm. this sensitivity, this embodied sensitivity, mm -hmm. and whether it be through this installation and what you guide people through, or the physicality in your dance works that really directly connect with a surrounding audience that you tend to engage mm -hmm. very viscerally, um, I think brings a dancer's sensitivity mm -hmm. to the humans who, are, who have never had that kind of training mm. or often live without thinking about right. how their body's feeling yeah. or the air yeah. around them and things. Um, yeah, I think the, the dancer's intelligence is one that is um, needed in this world, mm. I think. And often mm. undervalued. And often very undervalued. Yeah, the capacity for, I mean, it sounds very simplistic, but this sort of mirroring um, and also the capacity for like inhabiting a body that, it, that isn't there, right? Like putting yourself into the body of someone else um, is a really powerful social skill, I think. Mm. And like, yeah. It's really yeah. true. Um, when I was thinking about individual scores, scripts, right. you used another word for them too. The, uh, uh, the, oh, yeah. Uh, the, uh, well, the, 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 the five to seven minute pieces, which at one point you were giving some thought of just having one unified I was, the, yeah. the sonic experience. And then you really came up with six different yeah. journeys. Um, yeah. And, uh, but I think of that and your, as you mentioned, the opening of space. There's definitely linkages, and yeah. in space, when you welcome people, and people think, "Oh, this is just this is nice of the artist to just welcome me here," mm -hmm, and then you continue mm -hmm. on about maybe what their day was like and what they mm -hmm. went through to get there, and then it right. kind of spins into, and people are starting to go like, "Well, this is yeah. becoming a little odd," or a little too far "I wonder here. where this yeah. is going." <laughs> in a really interesting way, that often happens with. I think the scores is that yeah. you think it's some set of guided exercises and then suddenly new language and a different imagery and yeah. it takes you in a different place that you don't expect. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. I think that the, in space, of course, it's a piece about 
the, the hard work of grieving and dying. Mm -hmm. And I'm mm -hmm. sorry about the loss of your mother, which I know yeah. informed the work uh, that you made. Um, would you want to talk about the relationship of scale and the, made, the way and, uh, that you made, thank you for coming, space, and you chose to just do it on your own body mm -hmm. and have the audience help you mm -hmm. surrounded in this beautiful white cube. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Just uh, how you develop that work and how the, the work of grieving informed that work. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so... So um, when my mother passed away, I was maybe in the early phases of what would be developing Thank You For Coming Space. And I, um, I had thought I would make another ensemble piece, actually. Because the I, first two parts were for six or seven. Yeah, exactly. Hours. Yeah. And um, I had a whole, I mean, I had a whole very clear idea that I was going to move forward with and something occurred in, inside the kind of uh, shock to the system of, of, losing, of losing my mom and of being with someone as they died and the concurrent like uh, disorientation and reconfiguring of my own life that I literally, it, it was strange. I was like, okay, I've got to get, I've got to get that rehearsal scheduled. And I just would, I would sort of drop the ball in ways that I never have. And then ways that were frightening to me because I'm pretty driven and in love with what I'm doing. And like, you know, I'm on top of those things. <laughs> And so um, through counsel with dear friends and fellow artists, I realized like there was a reason and I had these hit hits of like, maybe this piece isn't what I thought it was. Maybe I need to let it go in this other direction. And, you know, I moved away from performing for the most part when I started making my own work, right. aside from a few things. And I really love directing. And I bring myself in as a visible director inside play and space, but um, I, I didn't really like the idea of being the only performer. Um, but it became a kind of necessity. And I, in this body that was my body, which was quite heavy, grieving, like different energy, uh, you know, not able to sort of push and barrel through mm -hmm. with adrenaline in the same ways, I decided to say, well, what happens if I actually allow this very unproductive, uncapitalist feeling <laughs> space <laughs> of grieving to mm -hmm. be sort of the ground that I let myself lay in and see what grows? Mm -hmm. And it felt like a huge risk because I was like, oh, great, I'm going to be one of those people who just, you know, lays on the ground the whole time or <laughs> right. something. And, um, and, you know, my, pe my pieces have a, a manicness to them. Right. They're excessively kind of, in some ways, there's a lot packed in, right? And there, there's quick and changes. Quick and, changes. Yeah. And it's almost ADD and right. it's structuring. And so this piece is, is very different in its structure, in its pacing, in the time that it takes, in the way that it drops in, in its use of objects. It's me, I think of it as less of a solo and more of me, objects, and audience. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so it's, it really was in, in many ways a kind of breakthrough. Um, and as difficult as it's been, and. The, I'm grateful for not the let's, you know, soldier on and just kind of get back to it, like that I was able to allow um, this massive fissure to be like a space for new growth. Yeah. And not in a way that was like, let's sublimate this into something or let's just you know, take all these feelings. It was really right. like, I have a new body state now. I am not who I was. Hmm. Um, so what if I turn towards that as opposed to doing everything in my power to try and get back to how I was and, hmm. you know, think hmm. so, yeah. You, it feels like 
um, all your work in some ways uh, draws from your own personal life experience, your own who you yeah. are, how you, how you engage yeah. with the world. But then the work itself um, clearly is related to your own life, but also has a universal quality that allows others mm. to tap right into it. Mm. Can you talk about that balance that you find? Mm. Or do you sometimes in the process find you've gone too far in one direction or another? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I find myself going between these two spheres of sort of trying to really listen in, like deep inside, both in terms of like creative choices, editorial choices, impulses, you know, um, and that's somatic and it's also cerebral. It's an internal reflective place. And then um, I'm eating the world. Like I'm looking at the world. I'm curious about the world. I'm, I'm, a, I'm the type of person where I'm at dinner with someone or <laughs> I've been at dinner with people and they've been like, what are you doing? I've basically been looking at the people next to me <laughs> who are not with us <laughs> because I'm so fascinated by people. And in my process, I am always bringing people in, whether that's outside eyes or audience. And the outside eyes are really directly people I trust and that are directly kind of helping me gauge that this is how this is reading, this is what you intend mm. kind of line. Right. And then the audience is also helping me gauge that, but more through their presence and like me getting to Meeting, me getting to feel within, with them, hmm. there. Huh. And then know, oh, okay, I just know something about this now that I couldn't know on my own. Um, so, yeah, it's, especially in the trilogy, I feel like I was thinking a lot about the social state of performance, the situation of performance, hmm. and how is it a culture? Hmm. How are we making a culture? in this, you know, Which hour and a half to together. <laughs> this experience, this in the moment, time together, audience and yeah. performer. And, um, right. Uh, which was really th thread throughout the work. All of, yeah. In some was. ways play, uh, you know, the second chapter, um, yeah. when you were thinking about playfulness and the notions of a play and theater mm -hmm. and the way in a, in a sort of a skew way of thinking, the way you think about it, what is theater today, also had a real political dimension. And it was yeah. about who are we as a culture living in this moment post-Trump yeah. in this time. And, um, yeah. and in many ways then space went into, went to a very personal, non-political, yeah. well, not yeah. on the surface political. Um, yeah. Uh, how how right. was that transformation? I mean, did you see that coming mm -hmm. um, when you were finishing up play and starting to think about space as a next work. Um. I did, I mean, I didn't see it coming in the kind of form that it did. And, and um, my mom, when my mom died, it was pretty quick too. So it wasn't as if I was like aware of that right. about to happen. Yes, and right. So that marked a moment, but I did feel after working on these two ensemble works and ones that were um, extremely energetic, packed, vibrant, wild, anarchic in, in many ways, um, and tight ships, ensemble, right. messy, chaotic, tight ships. Yeah. I felt fatigued. Like I was, the mode of, of making them had a kind of, and keeping them going, had a lot of management, management of people, management of, of many, many objects and, and a kind of production right. yes. thing happening. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and also, um, it, yeah, sprouted forth from a different fae, you know? And right. so, so I did feel like I, there's something has to change. And then I think the series of life events led it to be like, oh, this is, this is the... Before your mom passed and yeah. early, um, when we were finishing up play, um, I remember our conversations about what space might be. Yeah. At that moment, I, if I yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you were thinking maybe I'll do this yeah. in a gallery. I did. Yeah, that's and maybe correct. Maybe the temporal frame I used to working with will really be different. It could go for four hours or whatever. Yeah, and you know, it's 
true. And I find that oftentimes ideas either get like repurposed in ways you didn't expect or come back through the project. You know, like that was also an idea from the very beginning of the trilogy. It was going to be right. the very sort of pat way of saying it was dance play installation, right? And they were gonna right. all be kind of dealing with this, like how do we co-create the world right. that we're in together? And so instead it was, it was kind of dance and kind of play and then whoa absence and change life change right. and how yeah. do we hold this and now installation yeah. kind of sprouted out right meaning um, this meaning work. this yeah yeah well i know after you made space as much as i totally loved it we also were fortunate to have this mellon foundation yeah. support to support artists who may want to um, create work in a new way in a different frame um, and and we talked about, would you like to still yeah. explore the gallery in that way yeah. you were perhaps thinking a little bit prior to mm -hmm. the, fun, the creation of space. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So it kind of feels like a, a nice conclusion to the Absolutely. trilogy. Absolutely. I think too. in many ways for me, it's, it's an, a, a kind of perfect conclusion to it because to the, one of my primary modes is dealing with charge and vibration and, and by bodies and the, if this ephemeral form that we're in. To think that it would culminate in some sort of objectness seemed, or, or that it on, its only culmination would be the live moment where they all three come together, right? Right, like yeah. This, instead, this thing that is like a, a little ephemeral thread Mm. kind of passed to the bodies that come in mm. here feels like oh it's like a <laughs> why if i thought of the word virus which is the worst thing to think of right now <laughs> coronavirus <laughs> yeah coronavirus it's it just hopefully, a, erupting around by the, the world, time you're listening yeah. to this it's not happening no one anymore. will remember maybe <laughs> yeah. or maybe not, but, but in a good virus right. or like yeah. a yeah an instigation yeah, yeah. right yeah i i um i mean i think it's for us to experience the whole trilogy and then to see you make this beautiful installation, it was almost like your body and your company's bodies physically were yeah. removed, but yeah. the ideas and the embodiment kind of creation feeling. That's exactly is still there. right. Yeah. And all of that was like help made manifest and encouraged by the support offered here and like huh. by the dialogue that you and I were so actively in mm -hmm. for for so long right yeah. and I, I think that's really important and meaningful like the things are being made <laughs> that's so obvious sounding but because of the of the dialogue and the support coming towards them and the encouragement right. for that yeah. making and yeah. um, it's nice to hear, though, I, yeah. and I, I only manage one arm of the program yeah. at the Walker, but the Mellon initiative allowing us to collaborate with partners like Pavel mm -hmm. and have the visual art yeah. side of the Walker embrace an artist who has not solely but primarily worked in staged theatrical yeah. environments. Um, what are things that you learn through that process mm -hmm. or even if i so bold to suggest might um, advise other artists who mm -hmm. are were inviting in through a similar process what they might want to yeah. look out for or think about in advance right or, uh, yeah or you know think learnings that are possible in it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i mean i feel like i really kind of got walked through an entire mechanism mm. you know like the mechanism of how work happens inside a visual art space right. and all the parameters of, of things I'm used to that I work with inside of theater production were just different. Right. <laughs> they yeah. were just not the same. Um, and so I think that it caused me at times some kind of clenching and fear like it what does it mean when you say that? What do you want from me when you right. want that so soon and I'm not ready? What, 
Um, and so I would encourage people to just like pick up the phone and get in direct conversation right. about it. Yeah. And that, that I found that really useful anytime we were all kind of hashing out in a granular way, what right. does this mean? Um, right. Because I felt like often I was being constricted by something and then right. I would understand what, why it was happening and what structurally was needed to give me more freedom. <laughs> right, yes, um, right. So... It's a bit yeah. more codified a system, I think, mm -hmm. you know, because there's so many different component parts and maybe it mm -hmm. comes out of a more institutional structure than the making of live performance. So, yeah. it, and I'm learning this myself too, yeah. but so many other players waiting for information or, you know, right. involved in the sort of... And a lot of simultaneity inside yeah. one, I mean, depending on the institution, but in this institution, there's multiple exhibits happening. Yes, right. At the same time, rolling in and out. Right. Um, Which yeah. means that then um, everything is so carefully sequenced out in terms of people's daily workflow mm -hmm. and things like that, you know, so yeah. because they're working on four exhibitions at the same time, right. another premiere coming up or something. Right, like right. That. Yeah. I mean, I think that I would hope that the, I'd be curious to ask the same question and maybe if Pavel was here or, yes, you know, of right. what has, what have you thought about or what have yeah. you thought about changing or altering from working with me? And, you know, there's little things that, there's no staff for, you yes, know, for right. example, just daily cleaning yeah. and sort of like- For the gallery for the, itself. Yeah, yeah, for the gallery itself. Right. It gets, we pushed from one day a week to three. And, yeah. but if I want these positioned in a certain way, if I want the headsets positioned in a certain way or it cleaned or it right. neatened or yeah. there's no buddy for that. And yeah. because this is both an exhibition and a public space now because right. people are laying their bodies on it as a yeah. different set of parameters than a typical art object right. might. Definitely. And so, um, yeah. Which are good learning elements yeah, for really us really, institutionally. And, uh, and we talked about the idea of test audience, which doesn't really exist inside. No, right. And I was like, can I have a week of yeah. just test audience? Yeah. And I think a few days ago, Pavel said to me, no, we should have had a week of test <laughs> And I was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> I would have loved that. But, you know, that does not, that's not a norm. No, right. And so I think until you've also worked with an artist and you understand that intention of why you would need, like, this is necessary. Right. Maybe there's less willingness to change your norms. Yeah. And, and I there think was so a lot of collaboration and a lot of willingness yeah. here. But I think there's just, yeah. yeah. And I think looking back, it's um, nice to now know things we didn't know, even in process, we're just learning, but it was too late then. Yeah. We're like, how do we get these right. things? But yeah. um, I, 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 before, we, before we wrap up, I do want to um, ask you a bit about your collaborators, Jake and Nick yeah. in particular. Yeah. We're looking at these beautiful yeah. pedestals and they've been working with you on pretty much the whole trilogy, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, you conceived of the whole idea of the installation and how people would um, experience your voice and, the, and mm -hmm. the words and what their bodies, how they'd be situated. But what were Nick and Jake's contribution to yeah. this particular yeah. work? And then also the other, the other things. And maybe even our own insta installation crews and things like that as mm -hmm. well. But. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, so Nick Vaughn and Jake Margolin were collaborators with me on the entire Thank You For Coming trilogy, and they were, they were visual designers and helped me really think through how the space itself could be um, often one that was activating the ideas and the concepts of the work, like how mm. the platform could become the benches, could become the seats, could mm. become sort of thinking through this, they weren't just kind of coming in and having some ideas for set. They yeah. were like really helping me think from the inside out right. conceptually about each of those projects. And, um, and now they're really working mo mainly as visual artists. And so it just made so much sense to me that they would be collaborators mm -hmm. on this project. And we worked in a similar vein that we may on one of my performance pieces where we sort of really hashed out a lot of ideas mm. and through dialogue we together came to this idea of these sculptural pedestals mm. that would be like pedestals like sarcophagus, right. like, you know, like 
evoke a, f a few different things and create yeah. this tableau. And then um, they really did the like drawing and the designing right. of like multiple options of how this could look. Uh -huh. And we sent back and forth pedestals like this and like, you know, uh -huh. huge ones or more. How high, how low, what exactly angle. Exactly, what angle. And we landed on this fairly simple design um, in which I really credit their their eye for yeah. for creating and because it does aside yeah. from the interior experience it has such a, a beautiful minimalist uh, exactly spare yeah feel yeah to it. Yeah. yeah yeah and we talked through everything from the lighting to the so the sound um, Nick recorded the sound from space ah. and then the sounds of the sounds your, of, of different things. Gestures and exactly. the weight slamming and exactly. things like that. Exactly. And then slow, slowed it down and created this ambient sound. So we talked all that through, but it's like their hands and their eyes are such a, I'm so leaning into mm. them as visual artists with the skills that they have and as fellow thinkers and dramaturgical eyes to my mm. work. And it yeah. was nice from the performing arts side of things that they could create plans oh, yeah. and then send yeah. them because we've got shops serving the exhibition program exactly and things could just be built yeah it was i mean that is exactly what happened and it it was very cool that that could happen and also extremely ungrounding for me <laughs> because typically when i work with nick and jake they'll build one and then maybe i would approve of it or not right or, yeah so to not to only have things live in the realm of drawing or model was right. really new for me yeah um and a, a whole different labor process right. too that we were sort of just like well you guys build it and make it and right um kind of there's a lightness to that hmm. you know like you have to give up a certain amount of control but you also have to give up a certain <laughs> amount of control which is hard for me right yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this has been a pleasure talking with you. So about, good to talk to you, yeah. as always. And, uh, anything about the future, now having done this installation and this whole yeah. trilogy, it's been you know, just a fantastic nine years or eight yeah. years working together on yeah. things. Where do you see your work going? Not in great detail, but mm -hmm. generally, do you see yourself doing more installation-like work in yeah. combination with making new performance mm -hmm. work? Do you see yourself going yeah. into film or, um, you know, mm -hmm. public art more? How, yeah, where, where, I mean, where? I see myself, I see myself doing more exhibition and installation work Great. in addition to making performance and performance spaces. And I see those two things like impacting and altering each other. Mm. And, um, like I have a project coming up that's for a proscenium space, but I'm, my thinking about what that means is going to be very altered by this experience. Uh -huh. And and I think as I work in art spaces, I hope to continue to sort of push the envelope in that. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, yeah. we'll look forward to following and continuing to work with you going into Likewise. the future. Yeah. yeah. Thanks.